Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we welcome Charles Miller, co-founder and CEO of Link, L-Y-N-K. Have you ever been hiking in the mountains and you realize your cell phone has no service because you're miles away from a cell tower? And you tell yourself, well, I hope I don't twist my ankle. (laughs) Turns out space might solve that issue. What if you could trick your cell phone into thinking that the nearest cell tower is actually a satellite passing over. Well, we'll test this theory with Charles Miller, our guest today. Charles is the co-founder and CEO of Link, L-Y-N-K, a company developing a satellite to mobile phone satellite constellation that aims to provide a cell tower in space capability for global coverage. Wow, this is so many questions here. Charles, I just read in the news a few weeks ago, the FCC granted your company Link the world's first ever license for commercial satellite direct to standard mobile phone service. That's kind of a big deal. Bring us up to speed. Could you start with explaining what's your vision to bring satellite to mobile phone connectivity across the world? Was I, was I right about the cell towers and space thing? You are absolutely right about that. And while it might seem a little bit off this world or science fiction-y, the technology is working today. We're actually testing it in 12 different countries and on five continents today. And uh, the technology is proven. And our envision is, is that in the future, you will stay connected everywhere on the planet, no matter what. You don't even have to know. Your phone will just keep you connected. And you won't even know that it's connected to a satellite. You'll just stay connected everywhere. That's our vision. Well, that's that's really incredible. Uh, you can read all kinds of numbers on the internet, the number of phones that are out there. What, there's 7 billion people on like 5 billion phones? Or what's is that? Is that the right number? Well, they say there's 8 billion now, right? We wow. have a, we're kind of prolific as human beings. And so that's a, but that's a lot of mobile devices. It's, it's the, by far the most ubiquitous used powerful technology in, in the pockets or in the lives of most human beings on the planet is the mobile phone, right? So it's, yeah. it's, uh, and someday maybe everybody will have it. And, and, uh, some visionaries have talked about that you are assigned, uh, your mobile number at birth and it becomes like your, <laughs> your social security number so what? that, uh, you, you get it from the, the day you're born. Wow. Well, who thought the technology evolved to be something like that? Okay, so let me try to understand this concept again. You make a call from your smart smartphone, but instead of connecting to a cell tower, you connect to a satellite. Now, you know, it seems like battery and power and issues and distance. So without being too technical, how does it work? Well, your so your phone won't even know that our the cell tower it's talking to is in space. It can it can hear hundreds of cell towers simultaneously, and it has to make a choice, and it uh, does that all the time. And and your carrier, your mobile network operator, Verizon, AT and T, T Mobile, they tell your phone which tower to prioritize first. And so we will just add a space layer to that. There's the ground layer of ground cell towers. We'll add a space layer. Your phone will not be able to tell the difference, but your mobile network operators say which one you prioritize. And in the case where there's no ground-based cell towers, the, your mobile network operator will just say, okay, in that case, talk to the space-based cell tower. So it fills in all the black spots. And it's not like we're substituting for the ground-based towers. We're supplementing that. We're filling in all the black spots. And if uh, you go out in a remote area or even in, you know, there's an hour outside of Washington, D.C. area where I live, you're, there's plenty of areas where you you run into places where there's no connectivity. It'll just fill in all the gaps and you'll never stay, you'll never be disconnected. And when, you know, Earth, you know, Mother Nature takes out the cell towers like hurricanes and earthquakes and fires and tornadoes, it'll be instant backup from space. You know, I could be, to get back to these uh, mobile network operators, you'd, you'd first think that you would compete with them, but you don't. What you do is you you, you almost you, uh, you almost supplement, complement them. It's almost like you get in the areas where they can't get, and then you actually kind of working together almost a, here's a word from the past, a symbiotic relationship. Uh, you work together. We're going to be the mobile network operators 
best friend, right? We are, we are not going to compete with them. There may be other companies that uh, jumping into this that are going to try to take away, compete directly with the mobile network operators. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to be their best friend. We're going to extend their networks everywhere so you stay connected. And we think you as the end user, you don't want to have to figure out a, you know, and make a choice. You just want your existing phone with your existing plan to stay connected everywhere. You don't care whose name is on the satellite. And, you, you know, the easiest thing for you is that it just stays connected everywhere. So that's how we're going to do it. We live in a world of apps here. There's apps everywhere. Every time I turn around, someone says, put an app on my phone. So would the user have to install an app on the phone for this service? Well, the, for what Link is doing, your app is already on the phone. It's your messaging app. You're, wow. If you, you're doing text messaging, you can use the regular, you know, favorite text messaging app and uh, just send an SMS text message um, to our, our satellite. That's what we'll do at the start. And then over time, your voice and data plans, it'll just be voice and data, Your favorite, whatever favorite app it is that uses voice and data or or messaging will be just installed everywhere. So your your phone actually thinks our our satellites are cell towers and they work in all respect like cell towers. So let's say I'm hiking in Utah and uh, twist an ankle in the middle of nowhere. So do I have to wait for a satellite to come by or how does that how does that work? Well, the envision is you'll be instantly connected. You won't have to be any wait. There'll be enough satellites in the sky to keep you continuously connected wherever you are. And so that won't be the case. In the, in the first few years, because we'll need to launch a lot of satellites to get that, as we have the world's first commercial cell towers in space today, and we'll be launching more later this year and launching uh, accelerating ramp up next year. So during the first few years, there'll be what we, it'll be periodic coverage. And, and uh, the, the more we launch, the, the, the more frequent the overpass till it's continuous. And, and we think that for some people, everybody wants it real time, continuous everywhere. And we'd like to snap our fingers and, and make that the case. But it takes a few years to build and launch those satellites. But in the meantime, we don't think people will, you know, while, you know, everybody always wants more. We think people will say, well, the alternative to this is nothing. And OK, so I have to wait 15 minutes for the satellite to pass over to to be connected. That's infinitely better than nothing. And so that's where we'll start and we'll accelerate to getting to, you know, continuous everywhere. You know, we've been using uh, satellites to find a way around the block for years now. Yesterday, I used it to find an advanced auto, I had to go to an auto store in the middle of the day and work well. So what is the technical difference between using your smartphone to connect to a satellite for GPS and for phone service? Is there a technical difference? Well, there is a technical difference. The GPS is much easier. It's one way. It's the GPS satellites are, are broadcasting from space from many different points. And your, your phone processes those signals from three or four or five GPS satellites and figures out where it is. It does not need to communicate up. In our case, we've solved a harder technical problem that your, your phone has to communicate to satellites two ways. It has to go both down, getting data down and sending data up. And that's the hard part that many people didn't think was possible. We figured this out back in 2015 that you could close the link from a standard mobile phone. Moore's Law, you can give credit to Moore's Law. The processing power in your phone is a supercomputer. And so you have a lot of coding gain or process, extra processing power that, that has been uh, you know, advancing this both at the satellite side and on the mobile phone side. And, and now with modern you know, communications protocols, you can be connected two way. I live near the Appalachian Trail, and I talked about hiking earlier in August. I was hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains. And so, you know, so I think of this as being like in a desert in the mountains, but a whole lot of other places besides that, huh? Oh, absolutely. There's, we're, we, we're kind of a little bit blind to how much disconnectivity is in the world now, because mostly the, the mobile network operators of the cities and the suburbs and the major roads, they mostly have covered the major highways. But if you go on some off roads or you, you go out in farms, you find a lot of disconnectivity without going out to the mountains or the deserts, right? An hour outside of Washington, D.C. and western Loudoun County, there's a lot of people who are quite well off and have you know lots of McMansions out in western Loudoun County, uh, about an hour outside of D.C., 
in the last 15 or 20 minutes, many people driving to their their very big homes um, from their good jobs inside the D.C. area are, are, are driving without connectivity for until they get home. And then they get in their Wi-Fi hotspot and they're cut off. And they're they are actually in traffic jams on the way at home at night and and have no connectivity for the last 15 minutes. So it's uh, there's plenty of places in America that, you know, they don't have you know connectivity and we just don't think about it. We just think that's the way it has to be. Um because I'm very sophisticated, I went to YouTube and typed in like LYNK and saw a bunch of videos on your company. And I saw this one video. It was like it's from February from the Falcon Islands, and they had the first connection. It was really very exciting. It was all like a Super Bowl or something, you know? And I guess it was a Super Bowl from your perspective. So um, how many satellites does it take or how many satellites do you have now? or What's the projection? Well, we have – we built six satellites and built and launched six satellites. We built nine satellites, launched six. The first five were experimental test satellites. We were rapidly developing them. The sixth satellite, we have constantly learning. The sixth satellite that uh, solved all the key problems to bring the commercial service to the world is operational in orbit today. We have three more that are built and ready to launch, and we're, ra- we're going to be scaling up and, and uh, accelerating the build of these and launch of these satellites next year. And now we'll eventually, we'll keep ramping up until we build 5,000 of these satellites. There is so much demand and need for this around the world. Like you said, with over 5 billion people with mobile phones, the biggest thing we need, you know, biggest problem we're going to have is there's so much demand that uh, we need to build a lot more capacity to serve the uh, everybody on the planet. And so that's a great problem to have. It's a huge uh, market, a uh, huge need for the world. It's going to literally, uh, we're solving a problem that is literally going to reach out and touch the lives of billions. In residential broadband connections, they talk about the last mile and how expensive that is. And um, But I guess when it comes to this application, um, maybe maybe it's the first mile. <laughs> it's the opposite. Maybe it's the first mile since that's what gets them from their location to the terrestrial grid. So if a lot of these first miles are located in undeveloped areas, so where the cost, I guess the cost of terrestrial networks is, is really high. Can users afford this service? Well, absolutely. So we, the, what we've s- solved here, not only is a big technical problem, but it's an economic problem. Is building cell towers everywhere and stringing fiber everywhere is, is just impossibly cost prohibitive. And, uh, and so you just can't cover the planet with that. You know, in fact, 90% of the planet um, from a square mile perspective it has no coverage only 10 percent and you know so we've built out and we are building out about 10 percent of the earth's surface is where it makes sense to use traditional means uh, mobile ground-based cell towers fiber cable those types of things and the rest of the 90 percent is is uh it's just so expensive and that it makes no sense to build there and so that's what we've solved the problem for. It's much more economical to cover those other areas by satellite. You know, Charles, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast. Go to Google and type in Constellations Podcast to get to our show notes page. Here, you can get transcripts for all 100 plus interviews. Also, you can sign up for free email notifications for future episodes. I referenced the Falcon Islands earlier, and uh, it looks like there's some success in this technology to send text messages. So I guess the next step would be a phone call or maybe even accessing the Internet. So what's needed to make that happen? Well, our existing technology will support voice over IP as well as data. It, the problem we have is there's going back to that, what you mentioned, there's over 5 billion people wanting this is we allow people to do voice and broadband data, they use up uh, capacity on the satellite, we knock a lot of other people off of using the satellite. So yeah. from the beginning, we've decided the right thing to do is only allow messaging at the beginning so we can get everybody some connectivity. And if we didn't do that, you know, it, you know, here's what everybody should understand. A voice call, if I'm in a voice call, you can do about 5,000 SMS with the same capacity on, on the satellite for one voice call. And so you let somebody do a five-minute voice call, you're knocking 4,999 people off from having a connection. And if you do that and one of those people dies because they weren't able to contact their friends or family or an emergency responder, well, that's on you. And, and so we, we need to make sure everybody has some connectivity first. And then once we get enough satellites up, 
which we will, and in more capacity to enable people to do voice and data, we'll allow them to do that. So the technology supports voice and data at the start, but we think the, from a, uh, the right way to start is to make sure everybody has some connectivity. And our, our, our commitment is nobody should die because they have a phone in their pocket and they're not connected. Right from your website, saving lives and changing lives. That's kind of interesting. In a uh, recent Constellations episode, number 130, we spoke with a gentleman named Bill Ray, who's an analyst at Gartner. And uh, he suggested that by providing backhaul capability, LEO satellites can immediately deploy 5G service to underserved areas such as sub-Saharan Africa or rural Wyoming. Uh, Does this compete with the solution you're presenting? Not really. So they, they, what uh, that analyst uh, uh, doesn't mention is that technically he's correct. You can use satellite backhaul, but satellite backhaul to cell towers, ground-based cell towers, has been around for 15, 20 years. This is, you know, it, you know, there's nothing new with having to be from low Earth orbit. It's lower latency, but the expense has not changed of the cell tower. Building a cell tower is expensive. Maintaining the cell tower is expensive. You have to get power out to the cell tower. That's expensive. None of the economics of the cell tower has changed. In fact, satellite backhaul is more expensive than traditional forms of backhaul, so it's even more expensive. And, and so none of that changes. We, we solve a fundamental economic problem by, by doing it from satellite. And the fact is, is we can, we're only putting down bits. Our satellite will be, tran, you know, you know, be, you know, traveling over Wyoming like you. And we might as well put down a cell beam in Wyoming at a marginal cost that is effectively zero. So we can drop the cost and make it much more economical to the users in Wyoming and everywhere else in a rural remote community and make sure they're connected. We, we solve both the technical challenge and the economic challenge of universal connectivity. SpaceX, OneWeb, Amazon, and others, everyone knows are launching or are planning large constellations of satellites to deliver broadband internet. But all of these services will require a terminal. We just mentioned the terminal to send and receive surrogate to the low Earth orbit. So could they use the same technology as you and eliminate the need for a terminal? Well, they they could copy us. We're five years ahead of everybody, and some of them (laughs) are jumping in. But, uh, you know, their existing satellites, they have to totally redesign their satellites. The satellites you described are in much higher frequencies. It's called KA and KU band. Those satellites don't work for what we're doing. Those the KA and KU band is not good for connecting from space all the way directly to a phone. We are operating in what's called beachfront property for, for mobile phones in UHF. That's much better link characteristic. It goes through foliage and and trans and and uh, you know communicates and closes the link over long distances better. So that's the right place to go. It's already in the phone. And and there's a bunch of companies who want to jump into this. They, they're talking about new frequencies. Mostly those frequencies are not in the phone. So you have to wait three, five, seven, 10 years for those, uh, you know, for the phones to change if they ever do change. And so that's very risky. It's very costly and, and not coming soon. And so what we're doing is something that's a uh, spectrum that's already in the phone. And our satellites work with basically every phone on the planet today. You know, I deal with a lot of software developers. Would this be virtualizing a cell tower? Is that what, is that a concept that we could use to describe this? Well, that's an interesting way to do it, virtualizing. So we're using software-defined networks and software-defined radios in our satellites. Virtualizing, so we yeah. Can, we are virtualizing this, the cell tower exactly. space. That's what you're and doing. And so we can, we can do – we're constantly doing on-orbit upgrades of our satellite cell towers, and, and so that is the future. So That's what a software developer would say, exactly. Uh, Earth observation, EO, uh, it's had an impact on all kinds of industries. We know about farming and mining, commercial fishing and everything else. Do you see cell to satellite connectivity having a similar amp- impact on this diverse group of markets and applications? Well, I think Earth remote sensing and the <clears throat> revolution in small satellites is, is a big deal in in uh, coming in the world. But I think what we're doing is even bigger. It, we're, you know, this telecommunications is a $1 trillion a year market. And we are 
um, using uh, satellite cell towers to extend that $1 trillion a year market everywhere. So it's much bigger. What we're doing is a much bigger deal, I think, than uh, Earth Remote Sensing. And uh, what we've done is reinvent and reimagine a use case that nobody had thought of before, that you could have a satellite talk to a cell tower. Everybody knew for 30, 40, 50 years. We've been doing Earth Remote Sensing from satellite for 50 plus years. And so just doing it cheaper uh, was, is not a big surprise, but the fact that you could have a satellite talk directly to a standard ordinary mobile phone is a brand new open market that nobody had uh, thought about before. You mentioned um, Moore's Law and technology moving so fast, and it is. So how do you see the relationship between traditional cell calling and cell phone to satellite calling evolve over the next five years? Well, I think, you know, how it's going to evolve is you're going to stay connected everywhere, um, you know, one, and, and and five plus years from now, kids are going to, in the future, are are going to think that's the way it always was. So like they're going to huh. think it's funny that we were, you actually were disconnected. Well, that's kind of crazy. I think it's going to change how people think about traveling to remote and rural areas, that they'll be much safer. I think you're going to see changes in government policies and across a whole bunch of different things. For example, we right now, you know, the United States government subsidizes rural connectivity to billions of dollars a year. Well, that you know, there's no longer a need to subsidize that if everybody's connected. And if we use technology and innovation to to solve this big problem, you don't need to subsidize it. So there's going to be some profound uh, changes in national parks. The Coast Guard, it, you know, can't wait for us for uh, what we're doing to get here. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, you know, you hurricanes hit and you rush, you know, cell towers into places that hurricanes get hit and it takes days to get in. And now you got instant backup. So, you know, fires in California, they had a big issue. The fires in California, they shut off the power in California a couple of years ago. And to try to stop the fires, the fire started anyway. And then they couldn't tell people in certain communities that the fires were coming to get out of their homes because wow. the you know, the cell towers had no power. So we solved that problem too. So there's lots of ways that uh, this will affect people's lives. You know, Charles, I think you've really given our listeners a better idea of how virtualization can be applied to satellite communications in, in so many areas that we never thought of before. I'd like to thank our guest, Charles Miller, co-founder and CEO of Link. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review. 